In today's video, I will be going over what I believe to be every NBA team's biggest weakness and the depth in which I'll explain these depend on what they are. For example, like the Sacramento Kings defense is terrible and I don't think I have to elaborate on that more, but there are other teams that are better and more well-rounded, so you kind of have to reach for their biggest weakness. So with that said, this video is probably already going to be long enough as it is, so let's get into it. Before I continue on with this video, about half of the people that watch these videos are not subscribed, so if you've fallen to the 50%, then please subscribe. I am trying to hit 200k subscribers on this channel by the end of the year, so your subscription would be much appreciated. Also, drop a like on this video. It only takes one second, and it makes a massive difference in how the video performs. There's a reason YouTubers ask you to do it. Also, one last thing, episode 10 of my My NBA series is finally out now, going over the first round of the Nuggets series. I had to delay it like multiple days because I was falling behind on work, but it's done now, so go check that out. Starting with the Western Conference. For the Utah Jazz, it would have to be defensive versatility. What I mean by that is their wing defense is pretty eh. Outside of Royce O'Neal, they don't really have a plus wing defender, and one of the main reasons why they got killed by the Clippers last postseason was because they were constantly fucking up on the drop coverage, and that was majority blamed on Rudy Gobert, but also their guards and their wings were not keeping up with their man properly, and that kind of left him out on an island. So not having that wing defense or the versatility to not necessarily rely entirely on Rudy Gobert is problematic. For the Phoenix Suns, it is a lack of a superstar caliber talent. That is what I mean by stretch because Overall, the Suns team is extremely well-rounded. They are really talented, really deep, really good shooting, really good shot creation, really good defense, good playmaking. The only thing that they really lack in is that they don't quite have a superstar level player. And that's probably the cap on the team that's going to prevent them from getting as far as they otherwise would. For the Nuggets, it's going to be overall defense and specifically the exploitability of Jokic on the defensive end. Outside of Aaron Gordon and like Faku Campazo, who is five foot eight, they really don't have any positive defenders. Jamal Murray is a kind of positive defender, but Overall, defense is not great, despite the fact that their offense can be unbelievable when everyone's healthy. For the Clippers, playmaking. You know this one already. It's been talked about a million times over, especially on this channel. For the Dallas Mavericks, an over-reliance on Luka Doncic. Also something I have talked about at length on this channel and something that I explore and try to fix in the Dallas Mavericks My NBA series. So, you know, go check that out again. For the Portland Trailblazers, adequate help for Dame. Again, something I have talked about at length on this channel. The team did not do a good enough job this offseason building a proper contender around Damian Lillard, and they're never really going to get there with what the what they have asset-wise. So their biggest problem is just the entire existence of that team outside of Damian Lillard, essentially. For the Los Angeles Lakers, I'm not going to go with the cliche spacing. I'm actually going to say Russell Westbrook's off-ball ability. The fact that Russell Westbrook really can't do much when he does not have the ball in his hands is going to be the biggest problem because, of course, you're going to want the ball to be in LeBron James's hands a majority of the time, at least in the clutch and in the postseason. So... You know, regular season-wise, I think LeBron's going to be doing a majority of the spotting up, but when it comes time for the big moments, you're going to want LeBron making those decisions with the ball in his hands over Russell Westbrook, and Russ is going to be, like, sitting in the corner, and that's not very good. So that's, that's their biggest weakness. For the Grizzlies, Jaron Jackson Jr.'s health slash spacing. Really couldn't decide this because they're also kind of intertwined because Jaren's like maybe the best shooter on the team, which is not the best. Their, their shooting overall is just not ideal outside of like DeAnthony Melton and Jaren Jackson Jr. and sometimes Dylan Brooks when he's feeling it. So yeah, spacing and then Jaren is their second best player who is routinely not healthy. Uh, if he can get that health, that'll make a world of difference. For the Warriors, a reliable center rotation. This is another one that's kind of a stretch just because their depth is really good. They have a lot of wing depth and they have the shooting, obviously. They have the shot creation. It really just comes down to like Kevon Looney is an okay center and James Wiseman I don't think can really contribute right now. So it's an interesting predicament at that position, but they're also going to go a majority small ball five with Draymond as they've talked about already. So, you know, it's not a big deal, but it's something. For the San Antonio Spurs, everything besides young talent. 
This is a team that there's no issue with them having weaknesses right now because they're not trying to be good, but they have too many to really focus on. So everything besides for young talent, basically. For the Pelicans, Zion's health. Now there's also other stuff overall, but really in terms of what will impact their season the most, as long as Zion is healthy, that will be the most impactful. Last season he was healthy, his rookie season he was not, and it's always something that feels like on the forefront of everyone's mind of something that could happen and go wrong with the team. So his health is the biggest threat to their success. For the Kings. Remember how in the intro I said the Kings defense was bad? It's really fucking bad. It was the worst in the league last year and apparently one of the worst defensive ratings in league history. So yeah, it's not good. For the Minnesota Timberwolves, again, something I made a video on. Their health is kind of a big deal. If they are healthy, they are a good team. They have proven that last season that they are a 500 team when everybody is healthy, actually a little bit above 500. They just haven't been fucking healthy. For the Thunder, everything besides for young talent. Same situation as the San Antonio Spurs. This team is not really trying to be good, so they have a lot of weaknesses as a result, but it's really not a big deal because they're not trying to be good. What they do have a hefty amount of is young talent, but yeah, that's, that's just the situation in OKC. For the Rockets, veterans slash reliable role players. The reason I emphasize this specifically with them is because I actually think they have passable depth. They have good young talent that I think can contribute pretty early. But in terms of this team actually being like a playoff or play in type of team, as some people have suggested, they have the talent to do, which to some extent I agree. They don't have the proper veterans and I think the experienced players to really quite to get them there, even if they have the talent. They're also extremely young, so that is what's going to hold them back from being that caliber of team in my mind. Moving on to the Eastern Conference. For the Philadelphia 76ers, the Ben Simmons debacle. For the Brooklyn Nets, the Kyrie Irving debacle. What else do I have to say besides for that? For the Milwaukee Bucks, wing depth, and specifically a wing that would allow Giannis to play the five. The loss of PJ Tucker, I think is a bigger deal than a lot of people have given it credit for because PJ Tucker allowed Giannis to play the five and I don't have the lineup numbers, but I'm really confident that the Bucks with PJ Tucker at power forward, Pat Conton is small forward and Giannis at center is the best lineup the Bucks had all playoffs. And now they can't really do that. They can do Bobby Portis at the five and that's better shooting overall, but the defense and the versatility speed wise and all of that is not the same. And I think not having that go-to lineup is probably going to be a bigger deal than some are making it out to be. For the Knicks, reliable and consistent shot creation. Really, they have a couple of guys who can create their own shots and do it on a regular-ish basis. But they don't have some clear-cut person to do it and that is one that can be relied upon because we saw with Julius Randle with the Knicks last year, he absolutely stunk it up in the playoffs. Manuel quickly is sometimes great and sometimes just kind of disappears in the offense. Derrick Rose, a similar thing. RJ Barrett shot creation looks like it's taken a stride in the preseason a little bit, but only so much can be relied upon that at least right now. So yeah, that's their biggest problem because their defense and really their overall offense is not the best, but their defense is great. The offense, there's enough play finishers, but just guys who can create their own offense. There's no clear cut, easy option there. For the Atlanta Hawks, reliable wing defenders. And I mean that from a health perspective, as well as Reddish just not being very playable because of his poor offense, because Cam Reddish is a great wing defender. And DeAndre Hunter is a really good wing defender, and that alone makes your wing defense pretty solid, but DeAndre Hunter is has not been healthy thus far in his career, and Cam Reddish is a very big negative offensively thus far in his career. So the actual ability that that wing defense has to impact the overall team defense is flawed as a result of those two factors, but you get Cam Reddish being a little better offensively, and you get DeAndre Hunter's uh, health in order, and suddenly that's no longer a problem. For the Miami Heat, bench depth, though Tyler Hero might be in for a breakout year. I'm actually gonna make a second channel video about Tyler Hero's potential breakout year this season, but their bench depth is essentially Victor Oladipo, who is a big question mark, Tyler Hero, who's a big question mark, and then their next best bench player is Dwayne Dudman, who's an all right backup center, but should it be your eighth biggest player in the rotation? Let's put it that way. For the Celtics, a primary facilitator, they have a couple of guys who are passable playmakers, specifically Dennis Schroeder, Marcus Smart, and Jason Tatum. 
but overall their playmaking, there isn't some strong key guy in the playmaking department within their offense. And I don't think that's a huge flaw because they have enough playmaker by committee guys, but it is not the best thing in the world. For the Wizards, D -D defense. For the Indiana Pacers, no elite shot creator. This is a kind of similar problem to the New York Knicks where they actually have a couple of guys who are good-ish at shot creation, but they don't have some elite standout guy or somebody that you can rely on a night-by-night -night basis to just get you 25 points that he creates a majority for himself. Malcolm Brogdon can do that. Karis LeVert can do that. Damana Savonis can do that, TJ Warren can do that, but you don't have a one clear cut guy and you don't have someone who's just doing it at an elite level. For the Charlotte Hornets, it is still the center position and also there's a little bit too much wing depth on this team. What I mean by that is it's kind of a positive problem is just that like, there's not enough opportunity for Miles Bridges because you have Gordon Hayward on the roster. And also Mason Plumley is a fine starting center. He gets the job done, but their center rotation overall is still not the best. For the Bulls, big man defense. Their actual perimeter defense is pretty passable, even though DeRozan is a mediocre defender and Zach Levine is probably a bad to mediocre defender. Lonzo Ball, Alice Caruso, and Patrick Williams all being the guys who can defend on the perimeter. Their perimeter defense is fine, but Nikola Vucevic and his weaknesses defensively, I think, have the biggest impact on the team's defense overall. Even if Vucevic is overall fine-ish in terms of his defensive ability, not being good defensively at center has its consequences, and the Bulls feel those on the defensive end, and that's really what's going to hold them back from being a good defensive team. Tony Bradley is an okay defensive guy, but uh, it's not enough for the minutes that he will play. I think the Bulls will be a mediocre, passable defensive team but so long as Vucevic is the starting center, which, you know, he brings the offensive impact, obviously, they're not going to be a good defensive team. For the Raptors, they have a little bit too many forwards. Now that said, from what I've seen from the Raptors in the preseason, I'm actually quite enjoying, but that's also because I don't believe Pascal Siakam has played any preseason games, and that's probably a factor, and it doesn't feel too crowded at the forward position, but if they go with Pascal at center, and you're doing OG, Scotty Barnes, and Pascal in the game at the same time a lot of time, it's just gonna feel a little redundant and get a little crowded, and I think there will be positives to the fact that they have that much wing depth, but at the same time, a little crowded. Uh, and then they also just, what was the other one? No, that's the only thing I added, Never mind. For the Cleveland Cavaliers, Darius Garland and Colin Sexton, that duo does not work. I think they can both work individually to some extent or another, but I just don't think really in terms of taking the next step, those two can continue to coexist. For the Orlando Magic, too many guards. They have RJ Hampton, Cole Anthony, their new guy Jalen Suggs, and uh, what's his name? Fucking Markel Fultz. So they have a lot of young guards that need rotational minutes, and sure, all, almost all of those guys can also play two guard, but there's gonna be somebody who's gonna be short in terms of the actual minutes that they get, in terms of their actual development and that's not the best situation. Now, once again, this is kind of a situation like the Thunder and the Spurs, where there's actually a plethora of weaknesses uh, because they're not good, but there's also the fact that they have too many people at that position trying to get development and trying to get touches. For the Detroit Pistons, backup guard play, Frank Jackson is fine, but still their lone ball handling point guard is going to be Cade Cunningham. And, you know, Kate is going to go through his rookie growing pains and that factors in in a way that I think is relatively negative because if he doesn't really have it going early, that's going to be a problem for the Pistons because Frank Jackson is a spot up shooter and not really an on ball creator all that much. Uh, and they don't really have that coming off of the bench. So, yeah, those are my biggest weaknesses for every NBA team. Again, go check out that map series you have done already and shout out to Rudy for editing this video. But that is the end of this video. Please be sure to like and subscribe for more NBA content like this and keep the Archer music.